On May 17, 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren delivered the unanimous opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court in the matter of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. The segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe that it does, he wrote. And with that, the court overturned its landmark ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson, which had upheld the constitutionality of segregationist state laws under the doctrine of separate but equal. The court's abandonment of Plessy reverberated throughout the country, but by itself could not dislodge Jim Crow. Only years of social upheaval, first and most powerfully in the South and then nationwide, could bring about legislation as transformative as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Civil Rights Movement finally pressured the politicians to act, and the press served as its witnesses. With a presence in the South stretching back 90 years, the Associated Press was uniquely prepared to report it. Following the Brown decision, news features writer Bim Price set out to learn how the South intended to carry out the High Court's ruling. He answered from Little Rock in September 1954. The South segregation problem is incredibly complex. The South, as an entity, in which whites are uniformly pro-segregation, just doesn't exist. In Jackson, Mississippi, Price observed the increasing activity of the white citizens' councils that work to oppose integration. If there is violence in the South over attempts at integration, he speculated, it is likely these groups will find themselves involved. Violence would spread across the Deep South, from Birmingham, Alabama, where Police Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor allowed police dogs and fire hoses to tear into peaceful black demonstrators, to Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the Freedom Summer volunteers Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney were killed and buried in an earthen dam. In July 1963, AP General Manager Wes Gallagher addressed the racial story in the weekly AP log, referring to it as a social revolution and the number one story of today. He admitted that it would be impossible to cover every aspect of this emotional story to the complete satisfaction of everyone, an acknowledgement that AP coverage might displease some Southern members. The solution, Gallagher advised, was to handle the story with the utmost professional skill and traditional AP objectivity. The first major challenge to the enforcement of Brown came as the 1957 school year opened in Little Rock. Nine black students were prepared to integrate Central High School on September 3rd. Without warning, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school, blocking the students' entry and setting off a national crisis. On September 8th, Coleman A. Harwell, the liberal editor of the Tennessean, cabled the AP, believe it extremely important to expedite Pat Morin or some other top byliner to Little Rock. Situation building up to major showdown. In response, New York dispatched veteran war correspondent and Pulitzer winner Relman Pat Morin and brought in 16 others from the region. On Monday, September 23rd, the day set for the student's return, Morin took up a position inside a phone booth across the street from the school and began dictating. That night, he rewrote his story in the first person. Directly across from me, three Negro boys and five girls were walking toward the side door at the south end of the school. White bobby socks, part of the high school uniform, glinted on the girls' ankles. They weren't hurrying. They glanced at the people and the police as though none of this concerned them. Oh, God, they're in the school, a man yelled. A woman screamed, Did they get in? Did you see them go in? They're in now, some other man yelled. Oh, my God, the woman screamed. She burst into tears and tore at her hair. Of 28 afternoon newspapers that fronted Morin's copy, 20 used his byline. 
His reporting won him a second Pulitzer in 1958. While Little Rock was the capstone of Moran's career, the Civil Rights Movement inaugurated the career of Katherine Johnson. Johnson had joined the Atlanta Bureau as a secretary, but had passed the AP entrance exam, becoming the only female reporter in the Bureau. There was no story she did not want. She covered the integration of the University of Georgia and the Freedom Rides, and her relationship with the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and his family gave her special entree in the days following King's assassination. On June 11, 1963, Johnson found herself in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, covering the staged integration of the University of Alabama over the defiance of Governor George Wallace, who faced off for the cameras against U.S. Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Ketzenbach. After obtaining release from a press holding area, Johnson scampered underneath the table that held the microphones for Wallace and Katzenbach. And so I sneaked under the table, and that was another thing. Women reporters weren't, they just weren't recognized as reporters then. And if, I, if anybody saw me, they paid no attention. And uh, I was about a, a foot, a half away, maybe two feet away from Wallace's legs, trouser legs, and, and uh, Katzenbach. And it was a June day, and it was a sizzler. The, the heat was close to 100 degrees that day, and uh, I was on my knees with the notepad taking notes. <laughs> and uh, after that, I, I was able to get out, and, and what, you know, Catching Back said, uh, to, you have to integrate, it's a federal order, and Wallace said, no way are we going to integrate. So that ended the confrontation. That night, President John F. Kennedy addressed the nation on television. He portrayed the civil rights movement as a moral, not a legal struggle, and as an American, not a regional crisis. But getting civil rights legislation through Congress would require the boldness and outsized personality of Kennedy's successor, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, the former Senate Majority Leader. A Texan himself, Johnson understood Southerners. Born into poverty, he had spent his life working for its eradication. At this pivotal moment, poverty and race merged for him into a single issue. In his State of the Union message on January 8, 1964, he said, Unfortunately, many Americans live on the outskirts of hope, some because of their poverty, and some because of their color, and all too many because of both. Our task is to help replace their despair with opportunity. On June 19, 1964, the Senate passed the Civil Rights Act 73-27, to and Johnson signed it on July 2nd. From Johnson City, Texas, on July 3rd, the Associated Press filed an urgent, reporting that the President trusted that American citizens would make the act work, and that he would use any force necessary in the search for the missing civil rights workers in Mississippi whose bodies had not yet been found.